All right, I think we're gonna get started. So uh, this is service integration for application developers with ArcGIS REST.js. I'm Patrick Arl. I'm the dev lead on the developer experience team. And I'm Al from Boas. Uh, I work on the documentation side and the documentation engineering side on the same team. So Pat and I work together from time to time. Uh, so we've got a we've got a pretty solid agenda today. We're going to just go over some basics about what ArcGIS REST.js is, how to use it. Uh, we've got some we've got a whole slate of demos lined up, and we'll kind of do a little wrap up at the end and take a look at uh, kind of what's changed over the last year, two years, and where we're going with it, kind of over the next year. So, uh, ArcGIS REST.js is an open source client library for working with the REST APIs. It originally started as a collaboration between the developer experience team and the ArcGIS Hub team. Uh, we were building lots of wrappers around the REST APIs for managing things in our, in our apps, and we wanted kind of a common library to help accomplish that task. So it is open source, and again, we, one of the goals is we really want it to work in as many places as possible. So we want to maximize the compatibility with frameworks and with JavaScript standards and libraries and kind of code footprint and everything. So one of the goals is creating something that's really easy to pick up, drop into any existing app or framework, and then start accessing the REST APIs. And how we do that is we publish a lot of different packages. So there's one GitHub repo, and we've divided the functionality of the library up into now eight different packages. So that top one, REST request, that's kind of the core library. So the core handles request response life cycles, authentication error codes, things like that. And then the subsequent library is all built on top of that. So we have a portal package for lots of the item and group and user information. And then a lot of what we're going to get into today is actually these subsequent packages, like looking at interacting with feature services, geocoding, routing, demographics, places. And then new, over the last year, we have a package that actually helps automate the creation of developer credentials. So if you want to automate the creation of OAuth apps or API keys, we now have kind of a wrapper library that takes that multi-step process and really simplifies it. And this is a good diagram. I, like, I made this last year, and I showed it, and I really like it. And it really shows how the packages build on top of each other and kind of the philosophy. So the bottom layer is that core request package where we really do the nuts and bolts handling of how do we encode parameters? How do we make the request? How do we handle errors? What kind of errors do we look for? And then building on top of that, we kind of keep moving towards more specific workflows, like how do we handle authentication? How do we treat authenticating as an ArcGIS online or enterprise user differently than how we would, say, manage an API key for authentication? And then a lot of what you'll see today is kind of that specific implementation. So specific, and you know, we wrap specific REST API endpoints up in specific methods and give you a really easy way to access those. And then the area that we're starting to think more about developing is developing those kind of more complex workflows. So are there specific parameters in the API that are really complicated, like building out long, complicated strings for search queries when you need to search for items? Or how do you deal with dealing with like asynchronous job processing in like a geoprocessing service? So we have submit job for that. And the new developer's credentials package also kind of does that, where it'll create the item, register the app, create the credentials. That's, you know, bundles up three or four requests into a common workflow. So, since this started as kind of a collaboration between two teams kind of building management UIs, that's where it's really been picked up inside Esri the strongest. So that second use case, if you've got kind of a management UI that relies on stuff from your, your portal or your enterprise, it's a really good use case, especially in an environment where you don't necessarily have a map and you kind of just need to pull raw item, item information or raw service information out. Um, because you, there's no mapping component, it's just interacting with the REST API. Because of that, another popular case that we've really seen a lot of, a lot of uptake is actually using REST.js with open source mapping libraries that don't necessarily have native support for Esri services. So you'll see a lot of demos today, I think, in Leaflet and MapLibre and other open source libraries that, that we use REST.js to kind of bring the services into. And then the, the final two kind of scripting and automation workflows, I gave a talk yesterday about that, so it was recorded, so you can look for that one. I talked specifically about kind of scripting and org automation. Um, 
And then, with, you know, we've picked, it's been picked up by quite a few teams, so this is a stable thing. There's lots of teams inside Esri using it. Um, we use it on the developer experience team. We use it in a lot of doc. We use it in our dashboard UIs and things like that. It's also leveraged really heavily by ArcGIS Hub, and there's been professional services projects that have included it. So it's a really nice, stable foundation to kind of start using on. So in terms of installation, we've got, it works out of the box with, you know, over NPM. We also have a CDN. I think you'll see some examples of both today. Um, you know, we've got ES module support. That's kind of the preferred way, but we do support common JS modules if you've got older Node apps or, you know, older Webpack apps and things like that. And at the core, everything builds on this foundational request method. And this is really just, I need to make a request to an ArcGIS service URL with some parameters, optionally with some authentication. And that's kind of your base method for talking to any service. So sometimes you might find something that we haven't explicitly wrapped in REST.js. You can always fall back and get a lot of the same handling and logic using request, and you just have to put the full URL in. And then for the specific packages, you just also NPM install them. They're built in the same way around the same build framework. And then you can import the individual methods from those packages and call them. And this, this has some big, good benefits because most JavaScript frameworks now will actually shake out all of the other code from the packages that you're not using. So when you import geocode like this, you're only getting geocode. You're not getting you know, reverse geocode and suggest and all the other stuff along with it. And this also lets us provide specific TypeScript interfaces for the options. So the options for the geocode method are published and you'll get autocomplete in your, in your editor. And you'll also get autocomplete on the response object as well. So we've got a lot of that stuff wrapped up in, in some solid TypeScript interfaces. In terms of authentication, there's really two main ways that you would do authentication. You can either use an API key, which we're gonna show a lot of today. And then we also support ArcGIS user authentication. So that's through the ArcGIS Identity Manager class. Um, and that's, you know, there's kind of two ways to do that. You can use a username and password, which is great for kind of command line scripts and that kind of automation. Uh, and then we also support OAuth 2, which is on the next slide. Predominantly, since we're just interacting with services today, we're going to show lots of the API key path. Again, I gave a talk yesterday that kind of delves into the other half of that. But if you want to use OAuth 2, we've got workflows for both the browser and the server kind of OAuth 2 workflows also on that identity manager class that you can, that you can leverage. So in terms of error handling, uh, we do try to wrap and actually give you some solid error handling. So when you get errors from, from the REST API, we'll generally wrap those in that ArcGIS request error class. Uh, if it's an authentication error, like your token's invalid, or maybe you have invalid permissions, that'll trigger an ArcGIS auth error. So we separate the authentication errors out from the regular errors. There's a few additional types that are in that error types object, and those are all documented. So there's a few other kind of edge case ones. And then by default, if it's not one of the REST.js specific error types, it's usually going to be a network error type from the browser or from the node environment that you can handle. So it's really easy to differentiate. This was an authentication error versus this was just an error because you maybe had an invalid parameter versus you typed the URL in wrong and it's a 404. So there's a lot of good differentiation there on the error types. And additionally, we give you not just kind of the error message that you got back, but also kind of the specific details of the error, the code, the message, the full response, if you want the entire error, error response for as much detail as you can get. And then in addition to that, we also do the original URL and all of the parameters that were passed that generated that error. So you can have a really complete set of logs. You can have a really good understanding of when I make this request, this is what the error causes. So we give you kind of as much information as we possibly can back in terms of handling the errors. So we're going to go into demos. I'm going to do the first one. Uh, and I've got a geocoding demo. And then I'll, I'll turn it over to Al for some of the other demos. And this is one that, I've, that uh, has come up a couple times before. And we've got something really similar to this implemented on the developer website when you enter the address that's associated with a credit card. And since there's no map, it's a really good use case for REST.js in terms of getting kind of an auto-completing 
interface for an address form. So this is using the geocoding service. It's using the suggest endpoint to fetch the suggestions. And it's using the, the geocode method to finally get that final address and really break it out into its component pieces and then autofill the rest of the form. So I'm going to go into this. This is using Calcite components. So it's a, it's a nice, simple way. But you can also kind of apply this to lots of other frameworks. We use React on the developer website. Um, so if you've got a React app, I have a great, a great option for a drop-down library if you want to hit me up afterwards. Um, so taking a look at the, at the code, it is a pretty simple form built with Calcite components. So we've got a lot of the Calcite label, that main auto-completing combo box. That's our main component that we're going to interact with. So we're going to populate that with the suggestions on the fly. And the two things that really make that work are the allow custom values, which allows you as the user to type in anything you want into the combo box. And then the selection mode, which is single persist, which means you can only select a single option at once in the combo box. So you can't actually select multiple addresses if we suggest multiple addresses. There's a bit of a hidden input. So we're going to get back to the use case for the hidden input later uh, when we go into the JavaScript. And then the remaining is actually just a combination of Calcite label and Calcite input text fields to capture the remaining parts of the address. And then at the, at the end, we have a submit button. Taking a look at the JavaScript, uh, the first you know, four lines are package imports. The first two are for Calcite components. And then we get into the REST.js part of this, which we are going to use the suggest and the geocode methods. And then we have our API key manager class that we're going to import from the request package. That's going to be how we do our auth. We're going to go through and load up Calcite components. So this just loads the assets for all the components, the icons and the styles. Then we're going to create our API key manager. So this is going to import from an environment file that I've got on my machine, so I don't give you my API key. Uh, and this is specific to, to the framework I'm using for this, which is Vite. But you know, you've got your own way of loading credentials into your, into your apps. We're going to grab all of our inputs. These are all, all of IDs in the HTML, so we can grab all of the inputs. And then we'll wire up that submit listener on the form. So when you submit the form, we'll just pop up this little alert with the data just to make it, make that happen. Uh, and the only special part of this is where how we're generating that street address. So if the street address input, that hidden field, if that has a value, we'll prefer that value. Otherwise, we're going to prefer whatever the user typed into the combo box. So if the user wants to type in an address that isn't being suggested properly, it'll actually capture that street address that the user typed in. So next, we're going to wire up the suggest part of the demo. So we can listen to the Calcite combo box filter change. So that's the event that triggers whenever a user types into that box. And we can actually get an event handler for that. And we'll, look at, we'll dig into the component. We'll find that input field. And we'll get the value of the input field out from inside the component. And that's going to be the text that we use for the suggestion. There's some handling here that I'll return to once we implement the other half of this, which is the geocode half of this, where we actually turn the suggestion into the different parts. So we'll come back to that in a sec. And then we actually do call the suggest method. So we're going to call it with the text of our combo box. So whatever the user's typed in, we're going to ask for suggestions. We're going to pass our authentication variable, which was set up up at the top of the document. So we've got an authentication variable there. We want five suggestions. That's the max number that will show in the combo box, so we only need five. These next two are going to make it so that we only get addresses. So there's a lot of different categories in the geocoding that you can get. You could ask it for zip codes. You could ask it for cities. You could ask it for countries. Since we're doing an address form, we're really only interested in valid addresses. And then return collections false uh, also turns off returning those collections that might not be addresses. So this is, again, we're going to start narrowing down those results. Uh, there's a couple other ones. Source country is a good one when you're doing suggestions. Uh, this is, could be considered kind of the source of where the suggestions are going to be hinted from. So this will tend to hint more towards addresses in the US if that's what you want to locate. If you're interested in only getting US addresses, like even if I'm typing in a perfect match for an address in Germany, if you pass country code USA, it'll really only give you addresses that are in the US as opposed to just kind of hinting. 
Uh, there's also search extent is the other parameter that's worth mentioning. You can restrict searches to specific areas. And when that returns, we're going to populate the combo box. Uh, we're going to fill it with Calcite combo box items. So this will actually populate that dropdown. And we're going to encode the value of each of those suggestions as two variables, the magic key and the text. The magic key is really the unique identifier of the suggestion, and the text is kind of the full text of what that address would be for that particular suggestion. And then we're going to just assign the text label. We're going to create a big HTML string, and we're going to add that to the combo box component as its children. And then we'll make sure that in case it got closed, we're going to make sure it's open again. So that's actually how the suggestions get populated inside the box. To actually turn that suggestion into the address components, you can, we need to listen to the combo box change. So what this is is whenever the value of the combo box changes when the user accepts a suggestion, that'll change the value of it, and we can listen to Calcite combo box change. And we're going to get that value that we set on the item that was the suggestion that the user accepted. So we're going to split on those three semicolons that we put in between the key and the text. We're going to make sure that we actually have text to geocode. And then we can call the geocode method, which is going to talk to the service. We'll give it that magic key. We'll give it the full text of the suggestion in the single line property. And then we're going to ask for five output fields that match the five fields that we're trying to fill in our address box. And then we'll pass our authentication. Once we get a response from that, we can actually grab all of those individual components, so street address, city, region, postal code, country, and we can map those onto our inputs. And I'm, you'll notice I'm adding this hidden street address twice. This is a, a bit of a workaround for Calcite, so we're also going to save that street address part in a hidden field so we can get to it later. Then we're going to clear out our combo box, uh, and we're going to make sure it gets closed. So. That's, that's a really kind of simple demo. There's a lot of different components and frameworks. Most frameworks have their own kind of way of handling this sort of interactive dropdown. I chose Calcite because it's an Esri, Esri thing, and it's really nice and simple to kind of get that experience going. If you've got you know, something that you want to have a really well-structured address form, but also give a really good user experience to your users and try to auto-complete it for them. So, that's my, that's my geocoding demo. I'm going to turn it over to Al now to walk you through some other demos. Cool. All right. Yeah, thanks, Pat. That was great. So I'm going to take you through uh, a, a number of other demos here that show, uh, I guess, the, the benefits and how REST.js wraps up the different service endpoints that you, so you can get to them a little bit easier and, and, and perform some operations. So we're going to start with the places service, uh, and we'll look at the framework. The first framework is uh, as Relieflet. Um, so the first things first, so there are these different packages that Pat mentioned. So what I'll do is go to the, the places package. You can see the npm install, all the content basically we looked at before. But what I'm really interested here is in these different exports. So what you'll notice is that there is an export not for every REST endpoint, but for the popular ones and the common ones. So for example, we have find places near point. I wanted to find its equivalent or, or its friend on the REST API side, then I would go to the places service API reference, and then I would expand again on the, on the reference side for, for the REST service itself, it would be near point. So near point is the abbreviated kind of short version uh, of this that you get on the REST side. On the REST.js side, it looks just a little bit different because it's called find places near point. So you have to kind of make this mapping back and forth. It's pretty intuitive, but I just wanted to point it out to you guys. OK, uh, next, let's take a look at how to assemble an application. I'll take you through this, this process, which you'll see a few times. So I'm in the Esri Leaflet developer guide. And the sample I'm looking at here is nearby places and details. And if we just take a look at the code, one of the first things you'll notice is that we always pull in the request. Um, package and then places follows right after. It makes it pretty easy. And we'll go down to finding places near a point. And the only piece I think that I want to talk about here is setting up the API key too. So what we can do is it's really easy just to use the um, from, a, from key method 
pass in an API key and that gives us our authentication variable. Now we can, we can append the authentication variable uh, or add it as a parameter to any of the REST.js calls thereafter. So that's all done. Um, now we'll come here and take a look at an actual method call. So here we're looking at find places near point and we have an X, which is the longitude, Y, and the category IDs, radius, and authentication. So those are the base parameters to kind of get us working. Now, here's just something of interest. Let's go back to the REST doc again, and we'll take a look at find places near point, right? And we'll take a look at uh, the input parameters. And what you'll see is that the, the REST.js doc doesn't try to replace the canonical or the official documentation that lives in other places, okay? Because it is just a wrapper API. Um, so, but you will find things like category IDs. And you go to category IDs, um, it says it takes an array of strings. So, and this is for the places API, and there's a lot of, there's like a thousand different categories to choose from. So, um, we have to be a little bit intuitive here, but I want to show you a little trick. What we'll do is we'll just go to another section of the developer guide here. We'll drop into the mapping API location services where we have the high level conversation around, you know, using places and so forth. And we have this little tool down here called the places category finder, which uh, my friend Pat and his good team made for us. So we could find these things a lot easier. So much appreciated. So I could put in um, restaurants as an example, we get the 75 categories and then just grab the ID for that. So, there's a lot of times using REST AS, you still have to combine using uh, other parts of the documentation. It's just, just part of life, I guess. Um, okay, so that's category IDs. And then down after that, we have get place details. Really simple call. So I wanna show you guys. We have this method, get place details, takes the place ID, uh, the fields that we want back, and then we're reusing our authentication again. And REST AS is gonna append that token value to all of our requests automatically. So again, it just really makes it easy. So if we see this application in action, we'll go up to Santa Monica. And here it's finding uh, all the places, I guess this is landmarks and outdoors. But this is, these are the different categories. So these are all numeric values that are in the app. Um, so what I can do is basically follow those along and if we open up the network tab and we'll kind of see what's going on. So if I pick a location like Stefano's Dining, right? And go back here, then this is going to expose like the parameters that REST.js sent. So we have the request fields, elastic loop headers, um, actually let's jump over to the response. These are the place details that came back and what we're doing in this application is we're translating the JSON return values just to the HTML on the side. So again, that has to be done, that's your, that's your app, that's, that's what your app is doing and that's your responsibility as a developer is to bring that all to fruition. So I was working with the Places API and I was really thankful that Pat and his team uh, you know, built that little package for us. And I was working with the REST API and I was like, man, it's really hard to get past 20 places because you only get batches of 20s. So I was like, Pat, can we do anything like to page and help the developer kind of page and move through these things? And he was like, yeah, I think I can do that. So um, made it really super easy for me. So huge thanks there. So here's the first piece of code where we just get the first uh, 20 values back from the places service, right? So we just do this for each on, on the results and that's fine. But if we have paging set up, then what we can do is he created this nice little method for me called next page. And I can just see if there's another page of results to page and he sets up all the parameters and values and everything in there and returns that in the response. So now I can just await the next page and I can just keep looping through all of these. So let me show you what it looks like. So what I can do is get all of these places and just kind of page um, up to 200 uh, places can be returned through the paging cycle. So just a really nice example of where, you know, the REST API just wraps that up. Otherwise, I'd have to go to the REST API and I'd have to extract the URL and I'd have to reassemble everything and put it together. So is there a comment? Yeah, why is that 200, uh, 200 is a limit of the places service today. Okay. Yeah, so that's, that's exactly... That's what we have. It's mostly to prevent data scraping. So you can get two, it's 200 for whatever your parameters were. So you can get more, more 200 restaurants if you specify the restaurants category. So what you wanna do is you always want to confine um, either by category or by text and you know, just so, that, so the user gets something that's uh, very useful back. 
Okay, so that's just a little bit uh, of an explanation of the um, places package and some of the nice CDs that you get with that and then how to use the uh, tool as well. So let's take a look at REST.js and how it works with the routing service and we'll use a different JS library this time, we'll use CesiumJS. All right, so again, I'm in the Cesium uh, JS developer guide and all these samples are available. So everything you see here, you can, you can get yourself if you want. So we'll go down to the references. So we grab uh, the request package and then onto routing as well. And then it is simple as one, two, three. There's our API key code. Let's zoom in here a little bit. So we have ArcGIS REST. This is kind of our, our, our base reference. And then solve route is the method stops. And we just pass in uh, the various stops here in authentication. If you want to learn more about this interface or actually the, the actual uh, package itself, we can go take a look at the routing package and the doc, and we can see that we have all of these various uh, methods available. So there's quite a few actually. So solve route, service area, uh, closest facility. So we don't build out the entire REST API, but we, we go, we have the common ones in there. So I'll show you in a second how we can get to these other ones that aren't in there. So. Okay, um, so what's next here? Let's pull up the app. And so here I'm just running it sort of full screen view so I can, I can tap here and I'm just creating a, an XY location. And I'll, maybe I wanna go over here and that's going to draw us a route. Now let's say um, I want to use a parameter that isn't documented. So if I go, for example, back to solve route in the REST.js doc, I can see I've got uh, this interface. These are my parameters. These are the parameters that it's expecting. So authentication, which is always there, and then some other goodies. Um, and then there's the stops. But what about all the other parameters? There's about 50 different parameters on the that can be passed into this. So what Pat's team has done is put together this params method. It's just a generic param, so I can pass in whatever I want. So that means, yeah, I'm gonna have to, um, you know, I'm gonna have to slip over here to the routing and directions doc, and I'm gonna have to go um, and look at the uh, the actual REST API, and then, I mean, here's the list, like it just goes on and on. So I don't, I don't, I don't blame the guy for not, you know, wrapping these all up. So I'm okay with it. I, all I needed was a methodology to get to it. So um, let's just take a look. So all I need to do. Here is add the params param to this call, and I'm just gonna add find best sequence. So I'm gonna go from the default to find best sequence, and that should improve my application. So let's rerun this. And I'll click on a similar path here. And boom, there it's given us what it considers the, uh, the best path the least resistant and the optimized path for this application. And again, all it really took was just setting up this extra param that wasn't defined in the REST.js uh, library, but is accessible through params, all right? Okay, um, next, geo-enrichment. So we do have a, a wrapper package for geo-enrichment service as well. So this example, I'm gonna show you in open layers. Let's go over here. So it's same pattern. Well, first of all, we'll take a look at uh, the package itself. So in this case, it's up here. It's called demographics. We click on that. And we can get to the different exports. So a, you can see there's five here, or six, five. Um, the query demographic data is the one that we're interested in. And it requires uh, study areas and authentication and if I want to inspect the parameters for that, I can see there's a few other uh, suspects in here too. There's this one called analysis variables. Again, it's just string. It's like, uh, there's about, I don't know how many, 10,000 uh, analysis variables that you can pass in. Uh, and of course, REST.js isn't going to take on that responsibility. We're going to have to go to some other documentation to find out what the, where those strings are. So I'll show you how to do that in a moment. Um, okay. So let's look at the design pattern for building this app. Uh, what we're gonna do is add our REST.js references, just like always, and we, we're just referencing the CDN here because these are live demo apps that run in CodePen. 
So we have request, and then we have the demographics um, package that comes in after that. And then we want to execute the query. So nothing more than query demographic data, pass in our study areas, which are just, in this case, the simple geometry and authentication. We're going to use the default uh, value of one mile uh, for this particular operation. So if we go to Nashville, where one of my colleagues often frequents, um, this is doing that one mile search and it's giving us back uh, the social demographic information for four fields. So uh, how many people buy on average uh, nat natural products, uh, fees for social clubs, which could be important, um, auto truck rental on trips, average cost, and then the tapestry group, uh, group name. So let's say I wanted to add some more um, fields to this as an example, and like I wanted some different data back. So I could go out to the pen, and here I can see, here are the analysis variables uh, that are available, but to find out what variables I can actually use, I'm gonna go back to the Mapping API Location Services Guide. Um, I'll go to Data Enrichment, and we have this little tools here, and anytime you see something like tools like that, those are developer tools. In, in, in some way, they should be beneficial to you. Um, so I can click on housing, uh, maybe home value, and let's go down to like average home value. So I'm going to copy this variable name because this is a, like a piece of data I want to query from, from the service or with the service. I can go back to my code here and just to prove to you guys that it's, it's a real thing and I did copy it. it. It's actually gonna give us the whole JSON structure to do that and we just need uh, the field name in this particular case because that's all uh, REST-AS requires and that's all that the end API requires. So um, that's gonna give us another field for average home value and then we'll show that in our pop-up as well. So we'll rerun that same application and we'll do a little test. So we'll see maybe if we add a comma, then we can do a little test. So we're gonna look at the average home value downtown Nashville, looking at uh, about 500,000. Uh, and it's interesting as we start to move out towards the countryside more, you can see that home value drop down. So that's using the engineering enrichment service, but I'm just showing you how easy it is just to set up those parameters um, using some of the other dev tools to go and find the uh, attributes that we can query as well at the same time. Okay, moving on. Um, feature services. So um, how many people here, show of hands, used feature services before? Okay. These are one of our uh, most, most highly used, I would say, uh, coveted <laughs> services. They're very powerful. Um, and of course, we can use REST-AS, and we've built that out quite well. So let me show you the package and some of the functionality we have available. So here we are, feature service. Take a look at the exports, boom. <laughs> so there's a lot. Um, there's a ton of functionality there because a lot of people are using this, or a lot of teams internally that are also using feature service. So we spent a lot of time, and um, again, you can still use params, you can still do everything I showed you before, but we have a lot of specific methods for adding features, uh, creating, creating a feature service if you need to do that, getting features, uh, viewing the sources, and the one we're gonna look at is, is query. This is probably the most popular method out of all of them, and They've actually done quite a bit of work in here to make it easy to query. So what we can do is pass in the geometry, uh, the precision, the type. We'll take a look at some other parameters like the outfields. You can specify a string of the outfields that you want or star to get them all back. Uh, you want statistics, spatial reference. It kind of goes on and on and on. So you can see there's parts of the REST JS API I would say that are more mature. Uh, like this one, it's very mature. It's, it's very much in alignment with uh, the, the REST API specification for that particular service. Okay, um, so let's jump over to this demo. So here we're looking at a demo with Map Libra JLJS and same pattern, right? So we're gonna come down and we're gonna grab um, our request and our feature service, which are hiding over here. And to perform the query, 
Here's the query setup. So we reference uh, REST.js again, query features. Uh, we have to pass in the URL. So this is the actual layer that we want within the feature service. Then the geometry, the type, the type of spatial relationship. Uh, in this case, we want GeoJSON back. So we just set the format field here. It's really simple. We want the geometry and we want four fields that are returned. So when we look at the when we look at this application in action, we can trace a little bit on the screen here. And again, this is in Map Libra. This is our geometry that'll be passed to the server, and that's going to give us our parcels back. And in this case, we can show uh, the fields that we also got back of the four fields. So again, the, regardless of the JS library that you use, you can still wrap and use uh, REST.js in, in all of these different cases. Okay, um, so let's talk about this. We're starting to get a little deeper and a little more complicated. Um, this is an example that shows how to wrap up and use the spatial analysis uh, API with Esri Leaflet. So and, and there's a story to this one too as well. So um, I was writing with my team the uh, chapter on spatial analysis and how to access the service um, in, in the developer guide. And I was like, uh, man, there's got to be an easier way to do this because it's a job process. Uh, these, these are special services. They're for, for, for long tasks, long running processes. So I went to Pat and said, hey, can you wrap the spatial analysis uh, REST endpoint? And he came back and said, well, uh, no. <laughs> there's about 50 different <laughs> methods with about 150 different combinations of parameters. Um, like, okay. I said, well, I have to run this job process. It's like a geoprocessing task, right? And he's like, well, why don't I give you a job object? So his team created a job object, and um, I'll step you through it now. The other thing I'm going to show you, too, the other uh, package that we're, we're exposing in this sample is um, the, the portal package. And again, if you're working with your portal, I imagine you had a session on this as well, um, then this is another package of interest to you. Okay. Uh, but what I want to show you is here, this application integrates with REST.js to help with OAuth. So um, I'm just going to switch users here, and it's helping me present this dialog to the user and go through the whole uh, user authentication process. So now I have an access token that's sitting uh, in memory, and REST.js can make use of that access token for the duration that I'm logged in here. Um, in this example here, I'm interacting with the uh, spatial analysis service, and uh, these are parking violations in San Francisco, so there's a whole bunch of points. And what we want to do is try to find trends to see where the parking violations are, are the greatest. So I'm going to kick this off, and then I'm going to keep talking, because this will take a few minutes here. So that's going to kick off the process. And right, and I knew I should have done this in advance. Um, I may have missed the first send. I did. But as you can see, it's polling. So we kicked off a job process, this long running task on the spatial analysis service. And REST.js is pulling and it's checking to see when the service is ready. So it's using the job ID. It's all happening internally. I didn't have to do a lot of programming to make this happen. And when it's done and the results come back, then it'll, it'll stop pulling, it'll turn off, obviously, and then I'll be able to handle the results. So let's take a look at the source code. So I'm going to jump down to making the request here. So uh, there's a few hoops to go through to get the uh, analysis URL, so I'll just point this out. Um, on the portal package itself, there's a get self, which basically means you can ask the portal to describe itself and give you a JSON, you know, metadata string back or metadata JSON back. Uh, and then from there, I extract the URL. Um, so this is one of the only services that we have that we can't publish the URL endpoint because the endpoint is specific to your organization, depending on where your hive is, depending on what cluster you have and where you are in the world. So you actually have to ask the portal for a URL endpoint. REST.js helps us with that process. All right, so what I'm going to do here is, now that I have the URL, I'm actually going to construct the uh, rest of the URL to the spatial analysis service, and I want to call the find hotspots. Um, then I'm going to set up all the params for that. The input is going to be my parking violations. But now, finally getting to the REST.js again. Um, so I'm going to create a job object, and I'm going to submit a job off of that. That's going to have my spatial analysis URL with all my params. That's, that's ready to go. 
and then I'm going to pass in authentication. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to set up this listener, and this is going to listen for that job, and it's just going to console log out everything so I can see it working. And then when it's done, I'm going to await, and I'm going to get the results. So you can see that it's basically wrapped up this, this long process and all the difficulty of being able, you know, having to call the REST API yourself in this API, and, and it's really just you know, 10 lines of code. So huge thanks. I definitely owe this guy a beer. So um, OK, so I want to show you that. Let's go back up and see if our process is complete. Uh, and sure enough, so here's our feature layer that has been created uh, from the spatial analysis service. And it's just showing us where the hotspot areas are for parking violations. So um, this is both a demo on how to interact with the spatial analysis service, but it's also a demo on the job object that is available within REST.js. OK. And last but not least, uh, the surprise, right? So um, one, of the other, one of my other colleagues wrote this little application just before the conference. And he's going to explain this in excruciating detail tomorrow in his session on, uh, on open source using open source libraries. So this is actually uh, a demonstration that uses, uh, it uses REST, uh, sorry, React Leaflet. So it uses React Leaflet. And what I want to show you is how it also brings in uh, a couple other libraries that you've already seen today, requests, geocoding, places, routing. Um, I won't get into the app design too much, but basically there's a search control. This is our React component. And what I really want to focus is on what were the calls to uh, the REST.js library. So here's where we wrap up our calls to places, which you've seen before. Here's our find uh, places with an extent. Uh, here's the geocoding call suggests that Pat was showing us earlier. And then, I mean, this is it for routing. So you can see that the REST.js pieces are actually really small. Uh, the rest of the app is, is the React framework and building out the component and everything else. But uh, REST.js doesn't limit me in any way, shape, or form. So this is a nicely built app. We can actually go out here and zoom in a little bit to an area you might be familiar with. Uh, what I can do is look for restaurants, hotels, grocery stores, all these things. And let's say we wanted to um, highlight this particular place and we want to find directions. We've also integrated the, the routing API. So what we can do, and, and the suggest, so um, not to steal Pat's thunder <laughs> here, but uh, if I put in a renaissance, I'm using this, the geocoding suggest API here in uh, a CalSite component. So very similar to what Pat did, not, not quite as fancy as Pat's. Um, and then now what I can do is I have a start and a finish location. I can route, and that's a 12-minute walk to this um, pizzeria over here. So we want to show you kind of a complete application that's using you know, multiple services and multiple calls to the REST.js library and kind of packaging everything together at the same time. OK, I know that was a lot, but uh, I wanted to show you a lot. So some really cool things there. And uh, yeah, without further ado, I'll, I'll pack it, pass it back to you. Pat, and sorry about that. Here. Yeah, so just to wrap up, we're going to talk kind of through what's new in REST.js and kind of what's on the roadmap. So uh, in 2022, shortly after Dev Summit, we did a big 4.0 release. And that usually those major versions, like 3 to 4, we're probably going to do 4 to 5 soon. Uh, those will mark breaking changes. So. We shuffled a lot of stuff around at that release and kind of really got kind of modernized a lot of stuff. Um, the big item there is we also switched to automated releases. So whenever there's a commit in the in the repo, we actually just generate another release and ship it out. So we have kind of continuous releases, which is really nice. And that's also why you see in some of the demos, some of the version numbers are different for some of the packages. The four, the, so the four dot x packages are all compatible with each other. Um, but individually, they'll kind of get different different numbers based on if it's new features being added or just things being patched. So that led to a lot of good subsequent follow-up. So we actually shipped out another 20 releases, probably about you know 25 or so commits on the repo. And that's also that new jobs class came in, I think, around summer of 2022. So that was what Al showed in the spatial analysis demo. 
And then la over the last year, we've actually introduced two entirely new packages, one to support the places service, and then that developer credentials package for kind of automating the creation of developer credentials, wrapping up that entire workflow. And then we also got another kind of eight fix you know, releases where we kind of were just fixing small bugs and usually doing a lot of enhancing the, the type doc interfaces and documenting more parameters and things like that. So if you're interested, there is a change log. If you go to the GitHub inside the packages folder, each package has its own individual change log that documents you know, all of the changes and which commits caused which changes. And we, we really try to do a good job of communicating exactly what's changing. And because it's an open source library, you can go in and you can actually just look at the source code. So things that we're kind of keeping track of on our roadmap. So there are a lot of services. We want to keep supporting new services as they come out. And we want to keep you know making richer interfaces for kind of some of the existing services as, as we do things. You know, we'll probably add support for additional variables. We'll get them documented. We'll bring them into the type the type doc interfaces and things like that. The other change that we're really excited about is we're, we're keeping a pretty close eye on the native implementation of fetch in Node. So REST.js is based entirely on the fetch standard in browsers. Um, and previously, we were polyfilling that when you were using REST.js in Node. Node's now got a native implementation of that, which is really great. Uh, so we're, we're making sure we're still supporting both worlds while that's in the experimental mode, but it's been really solid so far in my testing. And then another thing that we're, we wanted to do this for a while is refactoring kind of the request options. So you'll notice when Al was scrolling through those big long tables, there was a lot of basic request options that were mixed in with all of the specific parameters for each request. And we want to separate that out a little more because those request options are really for more specific tasks. And we want to set, create a separation between the things that are specific to each individual endpoint and kind of the things that are general to REST.js. And that'll let us do some more interesting stuff, like if you want to cancel requests. Um, that's a big use case. It's really nice for like the suggest interfaces that we were showing. When the user types again, you can cancel the request for the previous suggestion and then start a new request for the new suggestion. So it'll make doing things like that a little easier. But mostly we we do those of us that kind of pay attention to the repo and work at Esri, we we build things in response to what people need. You know, a lot of it is driven by Al's requirements. Hey, we we're writing a new spatial analysis chapter. Can you write us a new class to make it easier? You know, we're releasing a new service. Can we release a REST.js package to go along with that service? Our team's wrapping this thing internally for a new UI on the developer site. Can we wrap that in a REST.js pack bit? So a lot of it is in response to what each of the individual contributors and teams needs. And some of those can be things that you need too. If there's you know, workflows or methods or endpoints or kind of things that you feel are really complicated, those are the kinds of areas that we want to start tackling with REST.js and figuring out how to simplify. So, And some of that can be demos like what we've shown today. Other parts of that could be you know, new packages or new endpoints or just kind of more doc. So. Uh, again, that's that's what I've got. Uh, please leave feedback. I read the feedback. I know you read the feedback too. So we definitely want to keep keep making sure these sessions are really helpful. And uh, that's what that's it. Thank you for coming. You can get to dinner. <laughs> so I think we've got about twelve minutes for some questions. If anyone if anyone has anything, yeah. So yeah, so the the question was is there was a an early comparison on size of REST.js versus other options. And yeah, it is usually the the most direct analog is the JavaScript API, so kind of loading the entirety of the JavaScript API and the minimum size that's necessary to get to a particular thing. REST.js that request package, the core that you kind of always have to leverage, that's 10 and a half k. Yeah, so you can just get that 10 and a half K, and then you can, you know, each of the other packages is only a few K. And then if you've got a build system, like a most modern JavaScript build systems, will actually 
take only the imports and ex things that you're actually using. So yeah, it's a 10K package, but if you're not using job, that doesn't get bundled in with everything else. So that's like half of that 10K. So we've got some demos that it gets down to very small, like 1K builds for, you know, if you're just plucking out a few methods, you can get very, very small builds. Um, again, because we're not loading a huge mapping library, we're not loading you know, WebGL processing, and we're not supporting the entire giant stack that the JavaScript team has to do. You know, we're supporting a very specific use case. So. So, sorry. Yeah. So, this is not really a question, but there was a, a session about Postman from a guy named Mark Corey who works in location services, and he's made these Postman uh, templates for this. It looks like it's just all of the current web calls. I just know if you guys are aware of that project. It's, it's pretty cool. <laughs> Mark's on your team. You yeah. just presented with um, him. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's one of my colleagues for sure. Um, yeah, absolutely. We're, we're very aware of that project. Um, and, and we hope, we would wish more developers were aware of it as well. So when you go to the developer documentation, we typically show you um, how to make calls to the different services using the different client libraries, so JavaScript and Kotlin and you know Python, all those suspects. Suspects, but we also find is a little link at the bottom that says "Go run in Postman." So that will go to that giant workspace that we have. So all of the calls, actually a lot of the ones that you saw here today too, are are Postman calls that they're right. They're they're ready to go. They're already predefined. They match a lot of the sample, or well, that they do match the sample code that's in the guide. And all you need to do is set up the, you, you fork the environment and then you, you um, set up authentication and then you can just test and call each one of these. So that's um, kind of like going directly to the source. So you're kind of bypassing REST.js in that point, but still it's a really good resource if you just want to make a raw request and you want to test the different parameters. So absolutely. Visit the, uh, it's the ArcGIS, yeah. Type in Esri Postman. Oh, Esri Postman yeah, yeah. workspace. So yeah, no, thanks a lot for that feedback and appreciate it. <laughs> you can fork it and, and make pull requests back to us and, and we'll take them for sure. So we, we want to get the word out on that more and it's actually, we use it internally a ton. So we, we hope you guys do as well too. Yeah, we do a lot of internal testing with that Postman collection. <laughs> so. Excellent. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, you were showing the job, job package that we called it, and it was checking your yeah. job. Does it have like a progress bar? Um, it doesn't have a progress bar. It does, Al showed kind of listening for the status events. I think depending on the, the exact job that you're calling, the job can send you a progress update. Like there's a message field in there, but I think it's unique to each of the individual endpoints. So sometimes you'll get a progress like percentage, sometimes you'll get like a numerical thing, sometimes you'll just get, you know, processing. Um, it's kind of depends on how how the geoprocessing task was set up. Um, sometimes you'll get it, sometimes you won't. So, yeah, I think if I was tasked with that, I would probably create just sort of a rotating, um, you know, progress bar just showing busy. Uh, if if you're not getting enough signal, yeah, and In, information indeterminate. About, yeah, <laughs> until it's done. Yeah. Yeah. Got time for a few more. All right, I think yeah. that's it. Thanks Great. everyone. Thank you.